We all want clean water, an abundance of natural wildlife, and a healthy and natural ecosystem for our children and their children to enjoy. But who benefits and who pays the price? Recently, a number of agriculture and environmental groups came together to examine these and many other important issues. Join us as we examine the social and economic value of Saskatchewan's natural capital. Later on. Um, our next speaker is uh, Bob McFarland from the Prairie Habitat Joint Venture. Uh, he's going to be giving the Conservation Agency perspective around expectations uh, and benefits of EGNS programming. Uh, Bob's an environmental consultant who currently serves as the policy coordinator for the Prairie Habitat Joint Venture of the North American Waterfowl Management Plan. His 33 years of professional experience in Saskatchewan focused on habitat conservation and included senior biological and management leadership roles with Ducks Unlimited Canada and the Nature Conservancy of Canada respectively. Uh, Bob's uh, uh, training includes an MSc from York University and a BA from Wilfrid Laurier and uh, ecological goods and services are a priority for the PHJV and Bob's current policy work including the organization of a national EGNS technical meeting in April of 2009. So with that it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Bob McFarland. Today uh, my presentation is really on behalf of the Prairie Habitat Joint Venture and its policy committee. As this uh, North American uh, map shows, the colored portion represents the PHDV boundaries for what's called the Prairie Pothole Region, which is in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, and portions of British Columbia. Not shown in, in a more recent inclusion within the administration of the PHDV is the Western Boreal Forest. Well, today's presentation will focus on the agricultural landscape of the Prairie Pothole Region. Uh, formed in 1986, the Prairie Habitat Joint Venture, what I'm going to call the PHJV, was established really with the simple purpose of implementing the North American Waterfowl Management Plan. And it's an international plan signed between Canada, the United States, and Mexico. It's designed to improve habitat and thereby return the number of waterfowl to the levels expected in the 1970s. Progress is being made toward that goal and through partnerships, it's advanced conservation. Stepping back a moment from the PHJV, we need to put our conservation role in a broader North American perspective. And you can see now that there's over 23 years of experience and many joint ventures formed across North America to reflect needs. I share this with you for one simple reason. What we have is a shared base or a network now for science, but the real opportunity is for policy and advancement of new areas like ecological goods and services. I want to share with you three perspectives, and the first one is um, Canadians must learn to value natural capital if future generations are to enjoy the same EGS that we do today. There's another translation, and that would be in the marketplace, a willingness to pay. We've heard this before, but I would suggest that the issue of moving forward for at least the conservation community on EGNS is it's much about capturing public support as it is with the development of sound policies and programs. Stakeholders, and I refer collectively to all groups really in the room here, must be sensitive to the, this perspective and ensure that the public is informed and then we're working together. A second perspective is the concept of EGNS becoming topical because the services, which are so critical to this functioning economy and our life support system, are at risk. Well, this perspective is particularly captured by most Canadians on one thing drinking water. How many people can f remember Walkerton, even here in Saskatchewan, we're dealing now with how to sustain the quality of water that we need for drinking. This is both an urban and a rural issue. And for the conservation groups that make up the PHJV, protecting and stewarding our wetlands is a key issue, and it really ties back in the end to drinking water. The PHJV, in PHJV interest in a healthy wetland ecosystem is a top priority. Restoring wetlands and retaining wetlands are absolutely critical for the PHJV in achieving its conservation goals. A third perspective, and really the final one that I'll, I'll talk to, is that EGS programs have the potential to increase the scale 
of investment in natural land stewardship and to reverse trends in habitat loss at broad scales. That's why we're here. And the PHJV is supportive of working with provincial and federal governments as well as industry and non-government conservation organizations. I really applaud the organizing group for bringing this meeting together. We're a group that's probably at the point in our evolution where we really truly are interested in EGNS and looking particularly at new market instruments. That's where our opportunities will be. Well, the membership to the PHJV are outlined on the slide here. I won't name them off, but it's a combination of both government, uh, provincially, federally, non-government conservation, and includes both environmental and agricultural groups. And today, I can only speak for the PHJV as the conservation community that's listed here. But there's a much larger conservation community that's more than just migratory birds. And uh, so our perspective is how we see it from, from our particular uh, ecological good that we're, we're focused on. It's important to note that while each member operates independently within their own respective policies and programs, each have a common bond through a commitment to following a strategic plan and a specific provincial implementation plan. Some groups by their own design are more active in field delivery and the makeup is a blend of, like, as I said before, both agricultural and environmental players. Some organizations serve only at the committee level and I cite the example of Manitoba Water Stewardship, Canadian Cattlemen's Association. The PHJV strategic plan has a key vision, and that's for healthy prairie, parkland, and boreal landscapes that support sustainable bird populations and provide ecological and economic benefits for society. I would suggest to you that EGS is embedded in the very way that the PHJV seeks to fulfill this mission. Our underpinnings really comprise three key areas, effective partnerships, and that includes directly working with producers, a combination of policy and conservation, but really supporting that as a strong science foundation. And what I'll follow now is examples that I can cite in terms of our own conservation efforts. EGS is embedded within our current conservation programs and partnerships. It's the most visible and can be measured in terms of acreage affected, landowners contacted, types of programming. The PHJV is focused on the natural capital of wetlands and uplands, and we are seeking the good of waterfowl and biodiversity while indirectly providing benefit to improve soil, water, and air quality. Given current habitat conditions, the goals are to both restore and retain habitat. Direct conservation programming has involved personal contact with landowners and aim to secure high quality, at risk, wetland and upland habitats on both private lands and crown lands. We generally employ longer term agreements, typically more than 10 years, and we use securement tools like conservation easements. Our stewardship programs are designed to motivate voluntary adoption or maintenance of preferred land use practices through the provision of information. And the target audience is wider and over a larger geographic area. Four simple benchmarks of accomplishments. We now work with over 400 partners, and the most important partner that we work with are over 17,000 landowners. We've conserved or influenced about 11 million acres in the PHJV, and over 23 years, we've invested over $700 million. And those dollars are both public dollars and private dollars. The structure of how we deliver is significant, and within each province, the PHJV is guided by steering committees coordinated under the direction of the Alberta Nawant Partnership, Saskatchewan Watershed Authority, and the Manitoba Habitat Heritage Corporations. Our members are exploring now the use of EGNS mechanisms to help achieve their habitat goals. We've heard a little bit about targeting and economics, and strictly from a biological angle, this map here, in, in the case of, of Saskatchewan, is a good graphic example of how we want to target our direct conservation programming. It's based on a situation of where we believe the highest waterfall benefits 
will accrue from investments in direct conservation programming. And that, is, that, that information has really come from a number of years of assessment studies, the development of modeling, and it provides us a basis then to target. Our next step now will be to, to highlight here the contributions of individual partners. Some of you may have seen this report from the past. It was done in 2004, but the key thing here is that efforts on EGNS have been led in the PHJV by specific members. And uh, this is a good early example where Ducks Unlimited Canada with the Nature Conservancy of Canada sponsored a national study entitled The Value of Natural Capital in Settled Areas. It was led by Nancy Oweiler, an economist from Simon Fraser University, in an attempt to put value on the natural capital in four watersheds across Canada. In the case of Saskatchewan, we were fortunate the upper Assiniboine River Basin was one of those studies. And it provided a foundation for uh, government to look at how natural capital could be valued. A second uh, important study on a national scale done by another member of the PHJV is Wildlife Habitat Canada. It took a look in 19, or 2006 at uh, a national survey of farmers and ranchers, and uh, the results are not surprising, but in terms of conveying information to the public, particularly the urban community, the survey confirmed landowner interest in and sensitivity to land stewardship. The, the results communicated to the public that the agricultural community is open to environmentally sound practices and ecological goods and services. Probably the most significant factor or, pro or example that we can cite of a PHJV partner in conservation has been actually Agriculture Canada. And it's been responding really to industry and non-government conservation organizations. And certainly a driving force to begin this effort came from industry groups expressing an interest in annual payments, the Alice proposal. Uh, the PHJV recognizes efforts made by Ag Canada to begin a formal process to establish a framework for EGNS. The 2006 National Symposium provided a consultation with industry and it spawned, as you've heard before, eight pilot projects with an investment of over four and a half million dollars. Those are now coming to completion here in a few days and three of those projects are within the PHJV. And we're very fortunate that one of our members, Ducks Unlimited Canada, is actually pioneering one of those studies at South Tobacco Creek. The collective experience from the eight pilot projects represents a critical information to design EGNS programs. And the work coupled with a policy and a cost-benefit analysis are now in the final stages. On a final point, I want to bring recognition to a very important study referred to as WEBS, or Watershed Evaluation of Beneficial management practices. This study will uh, provide us key information on the science foundation, the costs and benefits, and uh, will provide, I think, again, critical information for policy and program development. On new actions, there are three current examples. Uh, we have a, a national ecological goods and services meeting coming up in Ottawa, April 29th and 30th. It will bring together key stakeholders in the community. We'll find out the results of the eight pilot projects. It will be a stepping point along a journey of developing a national and provincial strategies for EGNS. And we're very uh, positive about that meeting. We're, we feel very um, good about where it will take us in the PHJV along with the Eastern Habitat Joint Venture, our co-sponsors. Two specific examples, I want to give credit to both Manitoba Water Stewardship in leading the launch of the Manitoba Wetland Restoration Incentive Program, which commenced in 2008, and the second one right here in Saskatchewan, led by the Assiniboine River Watershed in partnership with Saskatchewan Watershed Authority and Ducks Unlimited, have launched a drained wetland restoration program in the Assiniboine River Watershed. Those are just two example, three examples of current actions where the PHJV is acting on EGNS. Well, and now in the future, um, both the big picture has been a critical area for uh, concern to the PHJV. We've recently, in the last two years, completed a strategic plan. We've written a new five-year implementation plan, and we've been part of a continental assessment of all joint ventures. 
we feel there's real opportunities for EGNS, and we particularly are focused on retaining and restoring wetlands and looking at perennial cover by way of policy and conservation programs. We want to link this delivery to other opportunities, particularly watershed planning, beneficial management practices, land use planning, and agricultural policies. That's where our focus will be. On the benefits side, it's been told many times today, but I'm going to repeat it because it's in the show here already, but we feel that healthy landscapes benefit both agriculture and biodiversity. That includes waterfowl and other wildlife. Resulting from greater wetland and upland retention and restoration, we see in the future and now improved water regulation, better water supply, nutrient cycling, erosion control, sediment retention, and the contribution of climate change initiatives through greenhouse gas regulation. I guess looking forward, this is our wish list of expectations, and I think this is really the clincher in our presentation. And I put our top one, at, our, our high priority at the top here. A provincial EGNS strategy or framework would ensure clear direction and it would engage the various stakeholders from individual landowners to government departments. So if we look at today and tomorrow as a point to build from, I think collectively, if I had to guess what will come out of it, is a push for a provincial EGNS strategy. But what goes with it is need for leadership to assemble and coordinate implementation of a provincial EGNS strategy. Other provinces have taken a leap in this direction. Alberta, Manitoba have been cited as examples. Why not in Saskatchewan? We need it. We need that leadership. What we have here is a groundswell of interest. We need to translate that into leadership. And part of that will require government. It will require industry and non-government organizations. Conservation and the PHJV represent just one contributor to provincial implementation of EGNS. Their contribution becomes part of a broader solution, but their focus will be directed to specific benefits. Recall the map that I gave earlier? That's where our highest interests are. It's not universal. It's very specific to the benefits that we're seeking. So we're part of the solution. We're not the total solution. Sound economics with longevity and value for investment are essential for support by the PHJV. When I listened to the talks today about market-based instruments, those rang out to me as situations that would hold this particular expectation valid. And I think completing the pilot projects that are now just about to finish will provide critical cost-benefit analysis information. We need to learn from that experience and we need to translate that into strategies. On a couple of final points here, expanding the science foundation is essential. We think that you can take calculated risks, but you need to have a strong science foundation. Determination of value is essential to moving forward, EGS, towards a market basis. We can't lose sight of a science foundation, and I include economics in that science category. The PHJV success relies upon partnerships to develop tools, programs, and markets. And we'll continue to do that approach in EGNS. We would welcome the opportunity to work with players in this room to look at pilot projects. But we have certain expectations, and we'll hold true to those values as well. And lastly, we have a responsibility to communicate and ensure public input. That's quite critical, and I was really pleased to actually see that our Two days of meetings are being filmed, taped. Uh, that will translate into more communication. And I think the communication products that will come out of this meeting, the National Ecological Goods and Services meeting, uh, move to the table of decision makers in government. They move to cabinet and, and hopefully translate into programs. But uh, we do appreciate the uh, opportunity to, uh, to meet today. And on behalf of the Prairie Habitat Joint Venture, that's uh, my concluding point. Thank you. So that was the last pre presentation in our afternoon session. We have time for a uh, question and answer session. Uh, I'll, I'll lead off. Uh, Lonnie, maybe you could come up and, and join us up here again. 
Um, I'll lead off, since I gave everybody else the opportunity, if anybody has a question or two for Bob, I'd invite that now. Please come to the mic and uh, give us your name and organization affiliation. And then we'll kind of open the panel up for, for general uh, questions and discussion. Greg Bruce from Ducks Limited. Uh, Ian, I, uh, I really appreciate the, uh, your presentation, the producer's perspective. Obviously, nobody can give that better than you. The other thing that, uh, that came, pretty, came out pretty clear, though, in your presentation is you have, a, obviously, a very good insight on the other side as well, what society is demanding, what government is asking. And uh, that, uh, I, I'm guessing that's coming from the many discussions that you have with government about advancing eeg &S, both provincially and, and nationally. And the other thing that, uh, just an observation, Ian, and I'll share this with the crowd, is that uh, I've seen probably 10 or 15 of your presentations, all on Alice, uh, of probably the 100 that you've given. And each one, although you've got, you know, there's the core there and the key messaging, each one is different. It's continued to evolve. Your presentations have evolved, or your thinking um, on EGNS has evolved regardless. And you can comment on this later to see if I'm, you know, if I'm correct or not. But... One of the things that came out in your presentation that intrigued me, and I, and I have to get you to elaborate on this, is, um, well, there's a couple, couple things, but the one I'll, I'll pinpoint is on egg stability. And, uh, and again, that's the first time that I've heard a producer get up and, and suggest that we could have a discussion about bringing egg stability discussions to the, to the table when we're talking about EGNS. And I think that's very intriguing. I don't, and Maffrey might have some comments too, Lonnie. But uh, I'd like to know what kind of response you're getting from, from your colleagues in agriculture and from uh, agriculture, both federally and provincially, with respect to that notion. And you're right, uh, things do evolve uh, in the industry and in this whole discussion. And I've certainly, in farm community or farm groups, I have mentioned the, the concept of the safety net funding and whether we're sending the right message to producers with the safety net funding. We do have an opportunity with that AgriFlex and I think you used AgriStability. AgriFlex is new dollars and it's got some conditions attached to it. It's not to be part of the business risk management file and it has to be WTO green, which uh, provides us still with the opportunity to consider it as an option to fund any environmental goods and services program and it's available in every province across Canada. So I do see this as a key time with some non-targeted dollars available, I guess, if you want to put that, because that doesn't come along too often, where we can start down this road. And I do believe if we do start down this road, we will very quickly demonstrate not only to government, but to farmers themselves, this is probably where we should have had some of our focus of safety net dollars all along. But it's tough to tell a producer who's really hurting that you shouldn't get those safety net dollars. I can't do it because I know they're hurting. But I do believe we can solve some of the problems in a different way. And this morning I mentioned two problems with the same dollar. Government's got to like that. I mean, and you're right, I've been hanging around with government too long. Uh, <laughs> because I actually start to understand what their problem is every now and then. But I mean, the reality is they only have so many dollars. And the real, the real reality is there's only one taxpayer. And sometimes it feels like it's you, right? Um, you know, uh, we have to be careful how we use these public dollars to maximum benefit. And that's really what I'm talking about here is send the right message with those dollars, provide society with some of the benefits, the ecological system benefits, the service benefits that they want. And, but yeah, I recognize it's risky ground and probably the first time that a conservation group has heard a farmer say that. I don't t have too much to um, add. For me personally, uh, years ago when we started talking about this topic, um, and I think it's even before Ian Campbell's time, I was the co-chair of the Federal Provincial Territorial Working Group on discussing EGNS, and at that time, many people came to that table with a big fear of talking about the topic. They were really worried, what would it mean? Would it mean a risk to safety net funding? Would it mean we would lose other supports? Would it mean, and I've always had a personal philosophy of not operating in an environment of fear. I just think we're all better if we talk about these things. We might not agree on everything, but I always think it's better to talk about it. So when we talk about farm safety net funding, it's a reality. I mean, we are projecting overages in our provinces that 
exceed what health is projecting for overages in multiple, you know, in, in uh, several times. And so we have to think of, look, have to start thinking about that. And um, so certainly it's a policy decision. My job as a bureaucrat is to look at it and, and do an assessment of it, but, and consult with the industry about it and make recommendations. But it's a political decision in the end and it's a big change in thinking. So I don't think I have anything more to add. from the Biosphere Reserve at Radbury again. Uh, have you folks given any thought to, like from time to time there are in various parts of the prairies and in the farming districts a lot of institutionally held land, whether it be banks, credit unions, farm credit corporation, Ducks Unlimited, Nature Conservancy, all these agencies that, or even absent, absentee landowners. And if a program such as GS, uh, I mean, comes into play. Where do those benefits go to? Selling those services, and is there any way to ensure that they stay in the communities in which they're generated? That's a tough one because you very quickly get into the crown, you know, where do you go from there to crown, that sort of thing. But in terms of privately held land, um, we view the need for it to be a working landscape as probably a very important message. Now, depending on the type of business relationship that the operator of that land has with the owner, they may be the beneficiary or it may be the owner. So, I mean, as time goes on and we establish this marketplace, there'll be some inclusion in land values of these types of programs. And that usually gets government really worried because then they say we'll capitalize it and, we, and it won't be any value. But because this one is less directed to the production, and there's actually some examples in other parts of the world to draw on, this, this will be capitalized far less than any other program. But you do need that somewhat predictable nature I talked about, because we can't operate in a complete void on this. So, I mean, it, it depends a bit on the institutional situation in answer to your question, but the operator is the one that is generating the services from the landscape. He has to have both elements. You have to have both elements to actually generate the service. So the operator will have to have this discussion with the landowner as to, you know, if I do this, what do I get out of it kind of thing. Uh, or we'll end up with idle land. And as was said earlier, and I agree with wholeheartedly, working landscape is way more valuable than idle land. I guess the uh, only comment from the PHJV is we, we would deal directly with landowners, uh, private landowners on a voluntary basis. So uh, I think that's the most common way that we would uh, approach uh, both our current programming and any future EGNS. Uh, Don Connick from APAS. I, I just, uh, I know this is a speculative thing but and hard to address, but I want your opinion on it, whoever would, would like to offer it. And that I do believe that presently the, the rural landowner, the farmer, enjoys some kind of a warm, fuzzy uh, image uh, from, the, from the urbanites. And I'm wondering, what's your opinion on if we would be paid for ecological goods and services, does that change that image? Uh, does it make it better? Does it make it worse? Or does it change it at all? And I just like some response uh, might to. not be popular but you know I don't think the average urban person cares that much right now uh, it's kind of a personal opinion I we've done surveys before as a department to try and target our work for urban awareness and generally the results have come back that most of them aren't too it's not in their daily thought process about things where their food's coming I think it's coming it's moving along um, the other thing is that, uh, and you know, Ian knows this because I've said it before, I go to many meetings and farmers tend to get up and often they'll say, well, I got this bad habit called farming, but, or they'll say, I'm just a dumb farmer, but, and I just think, man, you're understanding yourselves. You guys are doing a great job. And I think when every farmer steps to the mic, you should be prepared to talk about what you do. 
And I think traditionally farmers are humble folks. They're not raised like that. They're not, you know, we don't talk about that. Like, I'd like to see farm groups do some more work on studying for risk communication so that you had key players in your sector that would speak when the media calls. When you go to meetings, what's your message? What's your message? Position yourself with your message. What is it? You know, who wants to invest in a guy who gets up to the microphone and says, I'm just a dumb farmer, but, or I got this bad habit. And I've heard it, and it just makes my insides just flip because I don't think it's true. And maybe that's something we can all work collectively on. You know, I've done some risk communication training with farmers when I was a working person, a specialist years ago, and, and uh, it was really, you know, productive. And maybe it's something we haven't done. Like, I think that in itself would be really, really helpful. I've done workshops before for rural youth. I'm a great supporter of the 4-H program. And what I have found is that rural youth kind of feel bad about themselves. Or they might, because they've listened to the media, think they are living with people who degrade the environment. And I don't think that's the case. The results of environmental farm planning in Manitoba were that many producers realized that they're actually doing pretty much everything pretty much to the best of their ability. And it was a positive experience rather than a negative. Now, that's just my personal comment. I don't know if it'll change the image, but that's something that always kind of gets me because you know, I prepare the minister to go to Treasury Board and debate for money. And we have to have a little confidence in who we're investing in. I don't know that I have much to add to that. Lonnie certainly did a good job. I mean, we do have an image issue. You're talking about the trust factor. I mean, doctors and nurses are on top of the list. Farmers are, are down a little bit, but we're still quite in the high, high end. Apparently, we do a bit better than politicians. Um, but the reality is it does provide us with this opportunity I talked about. There is still a, an element of trust out there. And if we can engage the public, engage the urbanites, in demonstrating to them that, yeah, we can do more than just feed you, which is, by the way, not insignificant, um, but we can also provide you with those environmental benefits, I think can only enhance our image. And Lonnie's absolutely right. We do not blow our own horns anywhere near enough. Uh, but. The communications between urban and rural is a real challenge sometimes, just getting the message in the right place. We struggle with it all the time. Actually, being an urban person, but having the opportunity to, to travel throughout Saskatchewan for the past 30 years, I've actually met a, quite a few uh, rural people, and, and I don't in any way feel that um, they, they lower themselves. I think they're quite proud people and very independent people, and I, uh, I'm happy to have been associated in my career with them. The difficulty in one of these sessions is to jump too quickly um, at sort of categorizing people into urban versus rural. But I think we will face that ultimately at the political level. And I think to have an effective provincial strategy for EGNS, it means taking the time to understand by survey what the opinions are. And those opinions will change over time, and they become a barometer of, of measure of success in influencing opinion. So I think if we go forward with a provincial EGNS strategy, we need a, a base point to know what those views are that are held. And all of us in the room have certain views or assumptions, and we could be wrong. And I think the uh, survey by Wildlife Habitat Canada helped urban Canadians to understand a rural perspective. And I would sort of challenge here in Saskatchewan that uh, we would be more served by a thorough survey that we could take forward to uh, politicians and senior decision makers as a starting point. Next, Bob. Next question. I'm Harold Martins. I'm Reeve of the municipality. and. Uh, my family run a cow-calf operation about uh, 850 cows, so I'm, I'm proud of that, um, and I'm a redneck. Um, and I'm proud of that, too, in a way. Uh, each of us have a bias. I uh, have a question. In order for us to establish a uh, way of judging whether we have value in our ecological uh, goods and services, don't we have to set what that original capital value is in, in what we have before we move away to, to say we've got to do something different. 
Uh, personally, we have uh, managed our place uh, significantly uh, to enhance the ecological uh, benefit. We've seeded thousands of acres of grass, and uh, do we get a benefit for that in the way it's, it's happening today? I, I doubt it. We've built dugouts and dugouts uh, and dams away from the creeks and the rivers in order to enhance the ecological uh, benefit in the, in the areas around the, and the streams. I think uh, we need to establish the, the value of what we have before we go from where, where we are to something else. We don't know whether we've gotten there if we, if we don't have a base. Okay, the, the whole issue of establishing value is one of the really tough questions to answer. But one of the things that Alice did that previous programs at that point in time did not do is we recognized the existing practices and put a value on them and paid. So what you've already done which is a benefit to you and also a benefit to society, has a portion of pu a public benefit to it, would have qualified under our program. And frankly, a lot of the programs we have designed up until that point in time and still consider and continue to design really only value something if it's destroyed and you restore it. So that's not the road we want to go down. That is a, a, certainly an arguable point, but um, we, we see that type of approach in terms of recognizing existing as the way we want to go. Targeting in terms of you know what practices did you do and what benefit was there? Certainly there's room to do that putting the value on it that we did in our pilot project Frankly, we followed the advice of the local community to a high degree uh, not only the farmers, but the Local municipality and the non farmers in the community and it was a pretty rural community um, And that's where a lot of the establishment of the value came from it wasn't heavily scientifically based it's another one of these things we get out there and get it, get it started. I mean, you can't wait till you get everything perfect or you'll never get it going. Thanks for your question and uh, very appropriate. I think from a wildlife conservation point of view, what you mentioned for land conversion, the wildlife the PHJV organizations can put a value on that based on our assessment work. Um, I think the other the other aspect, which never has really been talked too much about, but you allude to, is you know what value and and, and build around that is a much more um, sort of issue in the background, and that's a level of risk, risk of the habitat you know being threatened or lost. So if a particular land parcel in a particular area was deemed at higher risk, that's an area I think now that uh, the PHJV and conservation groups sort of want to add that dimension. Uh, into the valuation. I don't really know if I have much more to add. I mean, I think it's a valid point. You know, I've always thought I've been a soil conservationist in a previous life, and the best thing for conservation and maintenance is a profitable sector. You know, it's almost a bigger question, right? Because uh, it's the same thing like me. I've got, I've, I've got a small acreage, but if you have a little extra money, you, you make your place better, right? That's how it is, and um, so I know what you mean about establishing a value. The valuation side is just really, really, is really tough. But I, I don't know what to respond. But it's a good point. I, I personally think, and I have been involved as a uh, municipal person and as a MLA, so I have a little bit of an understanding about the cost. The the reflection that that the the value. I don't think any government could pay for the value that it is. And so then, then what you have is you have fudging numbers about what the real value is until you, it comes out as close to zero as possible. And I've dealt personally with uh, departments of finance that view it that way. So uh, dealing with this in, in the perspective of, of agriculture, I see it as a uh, kind of like going around on a merry-go-round where you have the center pole uh, hanging on to the prov provision of food services and the guy's going around on the outside for somewhat of a free ride, paying 25 cents on a, on a ride and then going for a ride on it. And, and to my way of thinking, uh, we, we provide not only the, the home for this wildlife and all of the stuff that's there, we provide uh, opportunity for people to come and look at it. I've been involved in tourism as well and, and that that is, is a part of, of uh, doing that. And uh, so I, I, I look at it from the perspective, if you put a value on it, make it a real value, not what people are prepared to pay 
and then and then proportion it to the the amount that there is a difference that we are contributing as a agriculture community to the benefit of the people in society. Uh, my name is Wayne Pepper. I'm an ecological consultant. Uh, I have a concern about the valuation system as well. And uh, I guess my big concern is in the image that we uh, have of uh, natural capital <coughs> and of uh, uh, ecological goods and services. And I think about the uh, need that we've identified as ecologists and environmentalists over the years to protect and preserve native prairie and native and natural wetlands because of its value as uh, in, in preserving ecological integrity on the uh, prairies. And I think about uh, how the people I know in the urban community think of prairie and they think of wheat fields. Uh, they don't really know what native prairie is any, any longer. The people in rural communities think of prairie and wetlands, or traditionally have thought of prairie and wetlands, as wastelands. We have an image problem. So if we're to put a value on ecological goods and services, it seems to me that one of the things we've got to focus on, and we have been doing this, but we really probably are going to have to do more, is in, uh, in the whole education and uh, communication area. Because uh, otherwise we're kind of batting our head against a rubber wall all the time. And I think we all face the same problem here. Bob, do you want to react to that? Astute observations, Wayne, uh, well brought forward. Um, the only thing I can relate to is a very current uh, study was completed on, at uh, Broughton Creek in uh, Manitoba. <clears throat> you might be familiar with that, I'm sure. And uh, the study looked at the hydrology and the impact of wetlands and water quality on probably the most sensitive issue, I think, right now in Manitoba. And um, a science study that crossed the barrier and got into a very excellent communications product. And it was put out by a PhDV member, a number of partners, but it was Ducks Unlimited, working with Manitoba Water Stewardship, Manitoba Habitat Heritage. And if I've missed anybody, I'm sorry, but what I find interesting about that particular product that came out was that it took what I thought was a very complex problem and put it into pretty simple terms in terms of phosphate loading into the system and where it would end up and what would be the impact of a watershed management plan and retention and restoration of wetlands. And if I had to predict, that may well turn out to be one of the most instrumental documents in shaping EGNS in Manitoba for the next year or so in the area of wetlands. In Saskatchewan, if it's native prairie, we've got good opportunities to draw from. And I think communications and understanding your target audience, going back, doing the survey, creating a communications product that conveys that message that uh, senior decision makers, um, cabinet can understand, will generate results. But I think it has to be led through some type of senior leadership or institution that will channel that kind of communication product or um, convey in terms of meetings and so on. Thanks, Wayne. I mean, those are, those are really good questions and observations. And I'll go back to sort of what I titled my little discussion. It's all about the change in thinking. And the change in thinking has to occur, yes, some in the farm community, because now we're going to view what we create differently, and we'll put more value on what you termed wastelands a few minutes ago. Uh, but we also have to change the thinking of the public and the policy makers at that level. It's, it, nobody escapes. We have gone a long time in the same direction, putting really no marketplace value whatsoever on environmental benefits. We have to change that or we will reach that point of shortage we talked about where the last unit is gone and then we'll really know we have a problem, right? 
uh, Ron Witherspoon with Interactive Management uh, Group. I'm a consultant. Question is regarding ecotourism and the role it has in creating uh, value. Uh, one of the uh, advantages I've had is I've had the opportunity to, to travel, uh, met with a VP of the largest uh, ag bank in Maine. A uh, large portion of their portfolio is, is ecotourism uh, uh, based, uh, bed and breakfast, people that will pay to be out in the uh, wilderness. I've been down in uh, Texas where uh, a fellow I met with, a 5,000 acre uh, cattle operation, uh, a large portion of his income was, was letting people come on to his, his farm and, and hunt. And he, he really ran his cattle operation with a low level of, of intensity. Uh, uh, an equal consultant that I listened to down there talked about the, the biggest uh, tourism attraction in the U.S. is birding. You, you know, people that will pay to come out and, and, and see birds in, in different areas. Uh, and so what she talked about is we Canadians really undersell our cool summers. If, if, if we really made an effort to market uh, in an area like Texas, where, where you die in four hours if you're out in the sun in July, uh, if you marketed our, our cool summers, we, we, we'd have a, a huge uh, amount of green dollars that would come in that would help pay for people to maintain the uh, biosphere. Well, I, I think you're right. I mean, producers have told me for a long time that they think there's a real value to hunting hunting rights and sometimes that's been given away for free there's a lot of you know I, I live in hunting country and uh, we don't exchange money but I'm telling you nobody gets on their hunting land there's no freebies uh, um, and it can be a driver I I've always been a little conflicted personally about the whole area of agritourism in particular and whether there is potential for profitability there and whether that's a, a big driver, I could be wrong. I think the cool summers thing is something I'm going to take away uh, as a message to think on some more. One of the things that's interesting, is just a side note, is when we held uh, that kind of national symposium in Manitoba several years ago, I was uh, entertaining one of the OECD speakers, Carmen Cahill, and what she could not get over was what the group looked like at the conference. She said, does everybody hunt where you are? Like, um, like she said, like, there was all these Ducks Unlimited people were talking about shooting ducks, and there were all these people talking about hunting all the time, and um, uh, that was a real shock to her, because there it's the vista. The biggest driver in Europe is the songbird people. Uh, they're ready to, they're willing to pay a lot of money to maintain the songbirds. Like every, the drivers are different, right? In the UK, my colleague in the UK, it's what, 97% farmland, the UK. People pay to go for a nice hike, you know? Maybe that's something we should look at a little bit more. I don't know. Like when I have entertained some people from, for example, Japan or these crowded places, they love our wide open spaces. And then I take them for a ride on my wagon with my two horses pulling it and we see a beaver as we go my goodness you couldn't pay for that in a country like japan but you're probably right so um i think it's a good point i can't resist um, <clears throat> responding to the comment because there's been some great success stories here in saskatchewan on ecotourism uh, both by hunters and non-hunters in fact uh, former hunters are some of the best wildlife viewers. And uh, here in Saskatchewan, uh, I want to bring to attention the, the nature centers in Chaplin, uh, Wynyard, Wadena. Uh, tremendous responses by communities um, used by both rural and urban people. I don't know how many people have dropped into the Chaplin Nature Center, but over 20,000 people a year check into the Chaplin Nature Center. And that's built around a wetland, and it's built around migratory shorebirds. And so there's a natural capital that serves Saskatchewan, very silently working away there. But in the community of Chaplin, it's been a great success. And the support of it has been strong by the provincial government groups like Saskatchewan Wetland Conservation Corporation, today Saskatchewan Watershed Authority were key players in helping that community build that opportunity and it's occurred in other areas so I think it's being recognized and I think local communities actually are starting to act on it. Um, I do believe that this is a good opportunity. We've had some successes but they've been pretty isolated. 
But um, as Lonnie said, most of it's been focused around the hunting, and, and I think that there is greater opportunity in the non-hunting side of it. Just, and as I mentioned in my little discussion, there was the, the landscape that we're in is not the landscape that was here. And this is what we're used to, and other people admire the landscape in a great way. Lonnie's certainly right. If you get anybody from Asia on your farm, the space just blows them away. In fact, they get a little agrophobic sometimes. But um, I, I'm sold hunting rights on my farm. Uh, not often enough, but uh, I do do that. Gary Noble, Saskatchewan Soil Conservation Association. Um, this, this morning I asked the question, when is the EGS policy coming? Um, any minute. Um, <laughs> this afternoon I've got a question, which kind of follows on the agritourism question, I guess. Uh, I really appreciated your comments, Ian, uh, from the Keystone Ag producers with regards to the fee-for-service. Um, but we've heard in the discussion throughout the presentations today uh, that government is struggling with multiple priorities and allocating uh, limited taxpayer dollars to, to uh, address those. Industry is certainly conscientious of any cost that's going to affect their bottom line. And uh, Joe Public, if he hadn't got laid off, is scared about getting laid off, so he doesn't have any money to uh, put toward good causes. So I guess the question to the panel, uh, Ian specifically, and the others I'd certainly like to hear your comments is, who pays the maintenance fee? Who bells the cat, eh? Um, it, that's the real challenge, and that's where I mentioned that there is currently a bit of an opportunity with the AgriFlex fund, uh, the way we view it. Uh, also with the soon to emerge, I think, desire to do carbon offsets, uh, that'll provide us an additional ability. But we're going to have to be creative about market instruments, uh, what else we can use. The tax credit approach that was mentioned in Manitoba hasn't worked perfectly, but with the right tweaks, I suspect it would be quite a useful tool. Um, we're certainly prepared to look at options, and as I mentioned, our suggestion is a phased-in approach. I, um, I know government wants to, does not want to take a big bite of dollars these days to put into something that they're perhaps not entirely convinced will work for them. We believe it will, and, and I believe that once they start down this road, and the pilots are part of that, demonstration farms have been part of that in other parts of the, pro or parts of the country, but if we can show a phased-in approach across a whole province, such as PEI has been trying to do, I think governments will be increasingly convinced that this is a good place to put their dollars because it, it benefits the public, it gives them a lot of what they need, and yes, it helps the farm community at the same time. So it's always tough to get that first one over the edge and, and running, and that's where the challenge is, but that's what we're trying to do. That's a tough question, uh, to put it mildly. I keep coming back to, uh, to this thought, Gary, is um, you can't arrive at a final decision without working through a process. And what we started here today is the beginning of a process. And we need to translate that into a provincial strategy that really starts seriously tapping options for how to fund and pay for it. But just as a side comment, a couple of things. We went back to the issue of what concerns public the most, water quality or drinking water. And in more recent times, food safety and you know, what's in our food product and where does it come from and why is it uh, in, in the condition that it is. So the public, whether urban or rural, has these common threads of issues. And to me, they're motivating reasons uh, for moving ahead and promoting an EGNS program. The market instrument is sort of a ray of hope because it starts to translate into new opportunities that, for instance, conservation groups really haven't been a part of. So we're keen to look at those options and find ways to partner. So I think the conservation community can be a partner in that, can be a player, but we'll have to be probably more in a larger market system. Well, a couple of comments. I think I'm as frustrated as you when you talk about when will be the launch of the EGNS type of policy because I've been at, where did he go? I like to look at the person who asked the question. <laughs> um, I've been at this for years and years, and it's a real dilemma because people are expecting it, and we've made some political announcements about that, and 
at some point governments have to do something. We don't, we don't know everything, but there is a point where you have to step out. I have a colleague I work with that always challenges me on that. And I guess I always think about an example, but I guess you can never win. And when you sign on to be a government employee, I guess you have to just expect to take it. And a real life example is years and years ago in the area of Manitoba where I live, um, we started planting shelter belts. Okay, it's a bit of an EGNS thing, maybe, maybe not. Well, at that time, you know, we looked at the prevailing wind, we did all the research. Well, the prevailing wind was north northwest. Okay, you know where I'm going with this, right? Okay, the fact of the matter is the damaging winds all came from the south. Okay, so we planted all these trees so that they would, you know, slow down the north northwest wind, and they just nicely funneled that southern, you know, damaging wind just nicely up there, and all our potato land lost all its soil. And, you know, um, Governments didn't re get out of that unscathed. You know, they did it in all good faith. They established this policy. They invested a ton of money. And I'll tell you, there's been more than one potato farmer that has taken me to task on that, even though I never planted those trees. But that's just an aside. But, you know, that's the thing. Like, there has to, like, people are more and more scared. I find now, because we have so much more public scrutiny, and maybe life has changed, that sometimes also political... Um, decisions to step out and do something like that are 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 held back because of the scrutiny and some of the criticism, um, but mistakes are made. The other thing, I guess, just to talk about a little bit about carbon offsets. Ian talked about carbon offsets, and you talked about the economy. Like one of the things we're very interested in Manitoba, which is more on the climate change side, which I do in my branch too, is trying to look at the potential of the voluntary market. That's our particular interest now. We don't see we're going to go rapidly to cap and trade. Well, we're going to join the Western Climate Initiative. We'll see. It's a, it, it changes every day. But we've always thought a lot about targeting the voluntary market. And I haven't really taken a test of that in the last little while about what people are paying. You know, when I originally started thinking about that, I just thought in Manitoba, well, why couldn't we for some, in some way allow... Uh, offset money to go to some Manitoba farmer the next time David Suzuki flies through and, and buys his offsets rather than planting trees in BC. Sorry if there's anybody from BC, we'd like that offset money to come right to our Manitoba farmer. That's what I always thought as a, pra as a practical example. And if any of you are interested, we actually have started a green registry where we hope to launch some ability for actually our citizens to buy through the voluntary market and it's, uh, it's www.greenregistry.org. And it's not as far along as I would like, but that's certainly what our original target was. And we're hoping to put calculators on that site and at some point where citizens can actually go in and would be assured that their investment would end up in Manitoba. So I think, I uh, you know, the, the devil is in the details in this question. Uh, when, we, when we get down to talking about specific EGNS, that's where we figure out the answer to the question about who pays. So uh, Bob talked about water. We heard about the Catskills uh, watershed case in New York State. Um, the, the, the taxpayers in New York City and the constituents in New York City uh, derive benefit from, from that, uh, that action in the supply watershed. Uh, the willingness to pay was there. It was a small incremental payment per household and uh, overall it worked. Um, I think that's where those those kinds of solutions are the things that are likely to to, to make this to make this go. Um, as another example, I, I was kind of expecting Bob to to mention this. Um, you know, I, it, it occurs to me uh, as I as I think about EGNS uh, as I often do um, that a lot of the money for the kinds of programs that the PHJV delivers comes from NACA from the United States, from the North American Wetlands Conservation Act. Uh, those dollars are flowing from the United States up here to Canada to undertake actions on the land, often in cooperation with producers, often paid as incentives to producers to do certain things. Uh, maybe not the payment rates we might like to see or, or whatever, but it's, it's an example of where those dollars are coming from. And, uh, I'm not an economist, but economists like to talk about that as club goods. Uh, that's, that's one way to skin the cat. So um, that's where the money might come from, some places like that, in addition to um, you know, industry and a, a sort of a cap and trade system or a developer where you might be using something like transferable development credits or, or, or what have you. So uh, the, the, the answer's in the details, I think, on that one. Any other questions from the floor?